Everybody, welcome to today's stream. My name is Cyrus Jansen. I am, of course, a YouTuber, a vlogger, business consultant, and someone that is very passionate about the countries of the United States, my home country, and of course, the country of China. Now, today's stream is going to be talking about democracy. Now, this is very much a hot topic. Many people are very interested in this topic. And of course, I think many people, you know, are very interested in learning about how democracy is going to evolve over the next few decades. And most certainly when you're talking about democracy, one of the things that always comes up is the country of China. Many people are interested to see, you know, will China one day embrace a democracy? Does China need a democracy? And, you know, and also I think what we've seen over the last year, especially, and it's, you know, since the Trump, Donald Trump administration, you know, we've seen democracy in the United States of America change tremendously. And I think a lot of people, I, I know a lot of Americans, for example, you know, we're really worried about the state of our democracy as well. And so I basically wanted to have a live stream today because I wanted to talk about, you know, democracy. I wanted to talk about China, America, answer some of your questions about this. And again, just have an open dialogue and share some of you, you know, my thoughts about this. So again, democracy is a really interesting topic to discuss because I want to come out and be very clear about this. Democracy most definitely has been the most successful form of government, you know, that we've seen around the world. And it has actually been very helpful for many, for millions of people. And it has done a lot of good things. You know, there's one thing that I think really does annoy me as a content creator that that speaks about China. And I, and I think some of the other people that cover this topic and we discuss China is the fact that sometimes if we say something positive about the country of China, automatically we get labeled as being anti-democratic or, you know, Cyrus, you're a communist or you don't believe in democracy anymore. Uh, that, that's certainly not the case. You know, I, I think democracy is a very, has had some very good success over the past few decades, but I do think that the world has changed significantly as well. And I think what we're, again, what we're seeing is, is we're seeing democracy has changed a lot. I think when you look at democracy in the 1970s and 80s of the, in the United States, it is very different than the democracy that exists today. And again, I, I think there's a lot of Americans that are worried about this. And I want to show a lot of, you know, some interesting statistics behind this in today's live stream. And again, as we get started here, I want to thank you all for joining. And I think it's it's pretty awesome to, you know, to be able to do this here at live on YouTube. I, I love having the interaction, you know, being live with you. This is a great way to start my weekend. And in the future on this channel, what I would like to do is to do more live streams talking about important issues. And so, for example, if there's any future topics that you would like me to discuss, you know, send me some messages. And what I'm going to try to do is either do a biweekly live stream where we have a general topic, you know, that we're going to discuss. Obviously, today is going to be America, China, and democracy. And then moving forward in the future, you know, we're going to hopefully be able to tackle different uh, different topics and everything. So let me just check into the chat as well. I'm going to be trying to ma monitor this chat. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for um, the first super chat. Really appreciate that. Uh, you used my quote, when the United States or the Western works together with China, the whole world wins. Uh, Kevin is doing some great things. You know, he's, he is from, he's based in England and he is fostering a relationship, you know, with business relationship back in a, in a small town in, in uh, China. And I think it's really amazing the work that he's doing. I, I know he's really grabbed onto that quote that I use on my channels as well. And again, that's something, you know, if you're following this channel, that's something that I certainly will continue to preach. We've got a lot of people coming in from Malaysia as well. Um, the quantum alchemist, um, saying, uh, you know, China is a semi-democratic model, not democracy, but again, not an autocracy is either. Well, the United States is clearly a plutocrat ran autocracy. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that we can, you know, talk about when it comes to the United States. And I'm going to bring up a couple of interesting graphs here just to help us all, um, you know, better understand a little bit more about this. So take a look at this data. This is from 1977. And what I want people to have a look at is th this is, I want to show everybody just how democracy has grown around the world. Now, we're going to focus really on three main regions here. Now, again, this is 40 years ago. 40 years ago, the, the democratic nations that you can see, obviously, are the ones that you would expect. Obviously, United States and Canada, you know, the Western countries, Australia, India, Japan. And these were really the main areas where democracy was. Not much of the world was a democratic, you know, government back 40 years ago. 
And in the past 40 years, again, look at those three regions, Asia, Africa, and South America, especially South America, almost everything flipping to blue, you know, all now embracing a democratic, you know, form of government, you know, Af Africa, you know, although not a lot of them embracing the full democracy, you see a mixed democracy. And I think that's something that's really interesting is, you know, finding a hybrid government. So again, we've seen over the last 40 years, and I want to just be very clear about this, because again, many people come out and say, Cyrus, you're anti-democratic, you don't believe in democracy. I do want to establish that fact very early in this live stream is the fact that, you know, democracy has done very well around the world. But I think it's really interesting, well, is when you look at, you know, this growth in democracy, not everybody did embrace a full switch to democracy. There was a lot of hybrid systems there. And this is something that I've certainly advocated on my channel in the fact that it's really important for every country to go out and find a system that is that will work for them. Because I know that every, you know, every country in the world, there's over 200 countries in this beautiful world that we live in. Everybody's country, everybody's society, everybody's needs, its people, its culture, its history, everything's a, a very unique. And there is no one way that is going to guarantee success for a country. Most likely, a hybrid mix of policies is what is going to work. So I just wanted to establish that, that yes, democracy is popular, it is growing, but here's the interesting thing. It has proven that there is more than one form of government that does work. And that, that's really something that cannot be overlooked right now. And that is, is some, certainly something that China has brought to the table is saying, look, you know, we have found a very unique system. We have found a system that is obviously it's state owned. It is state enterprise, state capitalism. And our main focus is going to be on how do we help the vast majority of people in the fastest way possible. And I think when you look that, you know, when you, when you actually look at China's growth, you know, there's been some incredible things. You know, we talk about poverty alleviation. We talk about the standard of living here. These are all important things that really need to be discussed. And I'm going to take a look at the comments here. And here's Daniel coming in saying, uh, Cyrus, the illustration is wrong. Many are forced to adapt the democratic system through U.S. Hegemonic, hegemonous pressure. And that is true. I mean, I do want to bring that up as well, is that my government, the United States government, has certainly been very, a very large advocate in, in installing democracies around the world. And this is something that, you know, I, I really struggle with as an American because, you know, there's there's... There's something that, you know, I always hear from American politicians, for example, for four years that Michael Pompeo was the um, Secretary of State. He always was saying America first. You know, we need to have America first. That is the best foreign policy, not only for America, but for every other country in the world. I never really understood that concept because, you know, you know and, and I've had people come out and say, you know, even China supports an America first, you know, foreign policy. And I said, no, you know, China honestly really doesn't care what America is doing. China is really focused on what China is doing. And I think there's, it's really interesting when you see America and how much money that we spend on war, on military bases, and really trying to spread, spread this idea around the world. It's, it's really a fascinating thing. And um, also, I get, you know, I want to just give a shout out to uh, Helen coming in with a nice super chat here. Nice. Thank you. I appreciate the support, Helen. Thank you very much. Uh, I just love being with you guys here and, and just being able to have an open mic. This is this is really fun for me as well. Just allows my train of thought to flow and a lot of ideas that I accumulate in the week to just come out on a live stream. It's a lot of fun. But anyways, going back to that thought, a lot of times I, I really wish that as an American citizen myself, I really feel that I wish our politicians would spend more time focusing on American issues. I actually wish American politicians would be a little bit more selfish. For example, you know, focus on Americans, focus on our issues because we have so many people that are struggling inside the United States. And I just don't think that we need to be spending all of our time and our resources traveling around the world. And again, you know, there is, there is this savior complex that we do have in the United States of America that we do feel that we need to come and liberate people. You know, I've had, I've heard many people just say, look, you know, Cyrus, people in China are slaves. People have no freedom at all. And if China really wants to experience success as a country, it much, it must switch to a democracy. And it's really an interesting concept to me because I think about it like, okay, let's actually just look at that logistically. How would that actually work? 
you know, how would China's government completely change paths and go to a, to a democracy? The, the first thing is, is we have to look, I think, at the people. You know, does the majority of Chinese people actually want democracy? And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring up a very interesting statistic here. I want to bring up here. And I want you to take a look at this graph here. This is quite fascinating. I want you to look at the blue dots first. And the blue dots here indicate, you know, the percentage of people in that country who feel that democracy is important. Now you can see, you know, the, the, the bigger countries, Poland, South Korea, you know, uh, Germany, Brazil, even China, you know, coming in at, well, all of these are over 80%. So we got China coming in at 84% of, of people, according to this poll, are feeling that democracy is important. Uh, not saying that it's the most important, but it is important. It's important value to them. Now, the interesting thing and where this really shifts, now, again, even, even notice this on this graph, the United States is coming in at 73%. So there, you can say that there's more people in China that maybe have an interest in democracy. But here's where things get really interesting. Look at the orange dot here, and we're just going to focus on the United States and China. One of the lower scores, or certainly in the median here, is the United States coming in at 58%. So you have 75% of people feel that democracy is important in America. However, you only have 58% of people that actually feel the United States is democratic. Meanwhile, you have 73% of the people in China feel that their country is democratic. Now, I think this is a really interesting graph because, again, I think democracy can mean different things to, to different people as well. You know, we, we always tend to think of democracy as, as one simple definition, one man, one vote. And if, for example, if you're allowed to vote for the, you know, president of America, I'm an American citizen, I have the right to vote for my leader. You know, in in, in uh, November 2020, I was able to, you know, cast a vote for either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And my vote ultimately decided who the United States president was. Now, we can kind of get into this and talk about the Electoral College and how actually my vote didn't really count, how it actually just were supposed to influence other people that actually had the vote. But generally speaking, yes, it, I mean, the Electoral co College is a, a bit of a, a bit of a hot topic issue in the United States as well. However, it is really important to know that this is how the United States system is. But this is something that Americans don't know. And I, and I have something really interesting to, under, to talk about because I live in Canada right now. And Canada has a very different form of democracy. And one of the things that I've tried to do over the years, I have tried to travel around the world and always approach things with a very open mindset. Uh, my mother is from Germany. And my father's American. I was born in Florida, but I, I grew up in a household with a very German mother. Interesting enough, my mother's, you know, she has lived in America for 50 years and she has never acquired American citizenship. She is a proud German national. She is very proud of her heritage. She's very proud that she's European and she really loves America. Obviously, she's chosen to live there. Her, you know, her son was born there, our family, she continues to live there. And she was very, you know, proud of the country that welcomed her as an immigrant. But, you know, but she's also very proud that she's European. And she raised me with this ability to think objectively about the world, to always look at things from both angles, not just the American way. You know, Cyrus, you're also half European. You need to look at things from a different perspective. Uh, Mansana, guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Um, I love it that, you know, uh, people come in here. We speak a little bit of German as well. This is great. Also, let me give us, let me give a side uh, shout out to Luke, Luke Mao. Uh, coming in with the super chat. Thank you, Cyrus. All depends on what good for a country and what is the country's goal. I completely agree with that. And we're going to continue to go down, you know, we're going to continue talking about this topic. I have so many things that we can share about this. Uh, Cyrus, speak to Deutsch, aber natürlich ist kein auch Deutsch sprechen. Yeah, I speak German with my mother. Uh, we, we speak German because, you know, um, for my mother is living in America and she lives in Florida. There's not many German speakers there. And, you know, it's it's great for her. And, and I actually, you know, German was my first language that I learned in America. And this is actually, this is a side note. This is an interesting kind of cultural insight into America as well. My first language, in, you know, growing up was German. You know, I was raised by my mother at home. My father was working. And I struggled when I went to kindergarten in America because I could not speak English properly. And as a result, my mother was very scared, you know, that I wouldn't fit into American society. So she just switched over to English for me. 
So I very quickly forgot most of my German and, and I didn't pick it up until later. And anyways, we're going off topic there about German. But the, the key thing is, is that I wanted to approach things with an open mind. And I've, tr I've been very fortunate to travel to over 60 countries around the world in the past 15 years. And I always take an interest in learning more about that country, its government, how the system works, how the people perceive that, and trying to put myself in their shoes. And I think that's something that more Americans need to do. Because I do believe that we have, you know, this, this entitlement or almost this, you know, this belief that America is the best way. But again, I'm going to go back to what I've learned here in Canada. I've been living in Canada for four years, and this is quite fascinating. Um, oh, hold on. I want to give another shout out to Reporterfy. Alex from Reporterfy Media has just joined the channel. He is an admin on this channel. Alex, thanks for joining in, buddy. Great to see you. <clears throat> Alex and I have done some work together on YouTube and we got some exciting things in the plans. Maybe I'll mention that at the end of the stream. But um, Alex is a good friend of mine. So I want everybody to realize this. When I came to Canada, here's the interesting things I learned about Canada. In Canada, you do not elect your prime minister. Canadian citizens do not have the freedom to elect their prime minister here. What you do instead is you actually elect your um, local member of parliament. And then that member of parliament goes on to vote for the, the party. So typically what you do here in Canada is you would be voting for the party, not the actual candidate. And that's something that most people don't know. You see, a lot of Americans, we assume that, hey, look at Canada, the UK, Australia. These are democracies, exactly like America. Very different, in fact. And this is something that we need to look at. Again, you know, Canada's democracy is fundamentally very different from the United States. Again, in the United States, we can vote directly for our, our leader, our president, in Canada, other Commonwealth countries, you cannot. You vote for the party. Here's the other interesting thing as well. In Canada, the current prime minister is Justin Trudeau. He is a member of the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is the governing party right now in Canada. The, the current party that is managing Canada, that is running Canada, they can call an election at any time. And this is a really fascinating thing for me to learn as an American. You know, for example, in theory... You know, you could have an election, you could have a prime minister election every year in Canada. Every single year you could call an election. Now, governments wouldn't necessarily do that because obviously citizens would become tired of that. They'd probably become annoyed and they'd probably vote you out because it's like, well, we don't want to have an election every single year. But again, this is a different, this is just different in how it's set up. We know, for example, in the United States, there's a very uh, strict timeline on when there's elections. It's every four years. It's always in November. It's going to be in November, 2024, 28, 32, 36, 40. It's a very systematic system. And the interesting thing about Canada's government is, is that there is a strategy on when you call an election. So for example, Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party, when they feel that they have the majority and they feel that, okay, I think we're in a position where we're most likely going to win the election, let's call an election. And then as soon as they call the election, basically both sides are all the, you know, political parties, they have about six weeks and to prepare, you know, for this election. And this was fascinating for me to understand because as we know in America, you know, you know, for the 2020 election, I mean, this started two years prior, you know, 2018, people were already like, who's going to be the Democratic nominee? Who is going to be, you know, you have this huge buildup, you know, to the United States elections. You have campaigns lasting, you know, well over 18 months. And I remember, you know, living in Hong Kong in, uh, in 2016. And the problem was, is, you know, it was a very highly anticipated election because, again, in 2016, Barack Obama was finishing his second term. So there was going to be a new president. It was either going to be Trump or Hillary. And at that time, you know, we didn't actually know Trump was going to win the, the Republican Party. At that time, you had 12 more, more candidates in the Republican Party. The fascinating thing was, is that, you know, you saw, you know, for, for the well over a year, I was constantly asked these questions about, you know, Cyrus, you know, what, who do you think is going to win the election? Who do you think, who do you think is going to win the election? And it, it was actually a tremendous amount of pressure on me as an American expat because, and, and it was just exhausting because you know, I didn't want to keep talking about the election for 18 months straight. And I, and I know for a fact, every American, you know, once the 2020 election was done, regardless if you, sorry, the 2016 election was done, you know, once Trump won, even if you didn't support it, I think you were just finally really like, okay, fine, it's done. Like now we can kind of move on with our life again. 
And we got a, a question in here. It says, in most countries, you don't elect the premier dir directly. Yeah, and that, that's, that's true. And that is exactly one of the big cultural things, because I guarantee you, if you ask Americans that, they would be, they would not know that fact. And I think that is something, again, when you see the United States traveling around the world, trying to bring democracy around the world, and this, this, this idea or this concept that one man, one vote, you must be able to elect your leader, that's not actually common even amongst many democratic nations. And so that's something that really needs to be established. So again, you know, you have these different forms of democracy. Now, I want to I want to bring up some more stats here because I, I think this is quite fascinating. And what I want to bring up is I want to bring up this graph. And this is a ranking of this is the democracy index. And this is this comes this is a yearly index compiled by the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is from an economist group that is based in the UK. Uh, from the magazine The Economist, and this basically is a ranking of democratic countries. Now, this is really some interesting data because you have, you know, you actually look at the first thing here is the regime type. Okay, we have the full democracy, and I'm going to I'm going to get into the definition of what a full democracy is. Now, according to The Economist and this this company based in the UK that that ranks democracy around the world every single year, there are only 23 nations in the world with a full democracy. Now, no surprising here that Scandinavia occupies five of the seven spots, you know, with Denmark, Finland, uh, Sweden, Iceland, and Norway. I've traveled to all of those countries. They really are fascinating countries in the way that they are run. Norway coming in, you can see consistently ranking, you know, it's out of a scale of 10, Norway is in at 9.8 at least, you know, for the last decade or so. So very high ranking on this system. And this is talking about basically the purest form of democracy. Good to see Canada, the country that I'm currently living in at number five. I think this would surprise many Americans. You have countries, for example, like Uruguay coming in at number 15, Chile, number 17, even the island nation of the Mauritius coming in at 20, all ranked above number 25, the United States of America. And this is something I want to talk about. Notice America is not a full democracy. It is a flawed democracy. And what exactly is the definition of a full democracy compared to a flawed democracy? Well, we're going to bring that up, and this is interesting. Full democracies are nations where civil liberties and fundamental political freedoms are not only respected, but also reinforced by a political culture conducive to a thriving of democratic principles. These nations have a valid system of government checks and balances, an independent judiciary, whose decisions are enforced, governments that function adequately and diverse and independent media, okay? That's a very important one. The media is a very important thing. We're gonna talk more about that. These nations have only limited problems in democratic functioning, okay? So again, let's just go back to that chart. So there's only 23 countries in the world, um, in 23 countries, I would say in places, because I'm gonna put just disclaimer here, number 11, Taiwan is, you know, Taiwan is, very interesting thing. I mean, United Nations, even the United States itself has recognized that Taiwan is part of China. Want to be very clear on that. But it is obviously does have some obviously has democracy in, in, in Taiwan, very unique system that they have there on the island. But again, there is some great things that are established here in the sense that there are only 23 countries in the world with this. But again, now look at the flawed democracy. And we're going to go back to that definition. And I want you to listen to the difference of this. And this is the United States here we're talking about. There are nations where elections are fair and free and balanced civil liberties are honored, but they may have issues. Me media freedom infringement and minor suppression of political oppression and critics. These nations have significant faults in other democratic aspects, including underdeveloped political culture, low levels of participation in politi politics, and issues in the functioning of the governance. Now, that is a very interesting thing to learn about when we're talking about this flawed democracy. And I think if we look at the United States, for example, we certainly we can certainly look at these you know, definitions, the difference between a full democracy and a flawed democracy. And I think it's very clear to see that we do have some of these issues in the United States. The interesting one enough as well is that we talk about low voter turnout. A lot of Americans come out saying, you know, democracy is so vital for Americans. For example, you know, you have to get out there and vote. 
every vote counts. You know, it's it's kind of funny as well because every election, you know, when you go vote, you get this little sticker. You go in and you're encouraged to put it on your chest. I voted. And you wear it proudly for the day. You walk around town. You want everybody to see that you voted and you've done your part. Take, a, take into fact that we have over 300 million Americans in America right now. And, you know, roughly, and now 2020, again, was probably the most anticipated United States presidential election in recent history, for sure. I mean, arguably one of the most because of the population growth in America. But again, you know, you still have just over 50% of Americans who voted. So, you know, no matter really what's going on in America, one out of every two are showing up to vote, you know. And the other interesting thing is, is that you have countries like Australia who have actually made voting a, a requirement. Every citizen of Australia is required to vote. If, if you don't vote, you're actually penalized. You're actually given a fine. That's something that I think, again, Americans would be find, find out very interesting to, to learn about. So it's, it's just really interesting how some of our politicians, you know, really go out and we just preach this concept that democracy is just going to be the silver bullet. You know, it's going to be the silver bullet to all of your problems. And, and this is something that I, I really had an issue with when I was living in Hong Kong. Now, I, I was living in Hong Kong in 2014 when the Umbrella Movement came out. And it was actually a really interesting time to be in the city of Hong Kong. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about Hong Kong because there's a lot of people that come out and say that China is suppressing democracy. Look at what it's done in Hong Kong. Now, the interesting thing with Hong Kong that we have to remember as well is that during the you know during its British rule, you know the the citizens of Hong Kong had very little democratic freedoms. For example, there was zero elections that happened in the city of Hong Kong under British rule. The UK appointed a governor you know, every cycle to fly to Hong Kong and become the governor. You, you, you know, Hong Kong people had no choice in who was governing, you know, the city. However, in 1997, after the handover, and this is also quite interesting because there was a tremendous amount of fear, you know, you know, leading up to 1997. Many Hong Kong citizens were very fearful that when the handover happened, Hong Kong went returned back to China, that it would be a disaster. Hong Kong would fall apart. You know, the future of Hong Kong was doomed. And you saw many people actually start to immigrate outside of, you know, to basically leave Hong Kong. That one of the areas that we saw a tremendous amount of immigration was to here, Vancouver, Canada, where I'm currently at. And this is an interesting side note. This is why you see, you know, a tremendous Chinese community here in Vancouver. And a lot of one of the interesting side facts is when you come to Vancouver and you go to really pretty much any Chinese restaurant, almost all of the owners and the waiters who have been here for many years all of them are Cantonese speaking. You know, they all come from Guangdong or from Hong Kong. And, and, you know, many of them left in the early 1990s, kind of fearing what was going to happen in Hong Kong. The actual opposite happened. You know, we saw Hong Kong continue to get better. You know, for example, up until a few, you know, even until last year, Hong Kong was ranking number three in the world on the Human Freedom Index. And again, many of those freedoms were guaranteed by China. And again, China actually introduced voting into the system of Hong Kong. Now, again, and the big issue in 2014 was the fact that, you know, Hong Kong citizens, a lot of them, and again, most of them was students and most of them was youth. And this was, again, this was Joshua Wong and these, these young students that were, they wanted universal suffrage. They essentially wanted anybody to be able to just come in and run for political office. Now, we know that Hong Kong is a very important city in China. And we know that obviously the um, the uh, prime minister, I forgot the title, it's not prime minister, it's the president of Hong Kong or the, um, what if I should the official title of the top ruling person. I, I, it is it is really, you know, obviously the top person that is governing Hong Kong is going to have, have to have a relationship with Beijing. There's no doubt about it. You know, Hong Kong is part of China. There's going to be a relationship between the Hong Kong government and the, you know, the Communist Party of China. The Communist Party of China ultimately is the ruler of Hong Kong. And again, this is something that many people don't understand is that the future of Hong Kong is really guaranteed by a prosperous relationship with the country of China, you know, with its homeland, you know. And so it was really interesting to be down. I was in, I was in Occupy Central. I would go down there and talk with the students. And I would say, you know, what are your biggest issues with 
you know, why do you fight for democracy? What are your issues that want to be solved? And they said, you know, we, we just want democracy. We want to be like America. We think if we can vote for whoever we want, this would solve all of our issues. But, I, you know, and I think there are some really big issues that need to be solved in, in Hong Kong. For example, the, the common one that you're going to always hear is certainly going to be uh, the, the amount of, of, of housing. Housing is a tremendously huge problem. And I think the bigger problem with Hong Kong right now is, is the oligarchs who control large amounts of land. You have some of the most wealthiest individuals that control that are just hoarding large amounts of land in Hong Kong that are not being developed. And obviously, just by sitting on this land, you, you, you can influence the supply and demand of you know, real estate. And of course, if, if you have a huge area that's not being developed, that means that there's less housing available. That means the price, you know, price of housing is going up. I think one of the interesting systems is actually the country of Singapore. In Singapore, there is a government policy that every Singaporean national has a pathway to home ownership. That's quite incredible. Actually, Singapore, to be honest, is probably my favorite country in the world. I really love the government in Singapore. I love the system, how Singapore works. But again, if you were to look back at this graph, I don't have that data immediately, but if you're looking at the rank of democracy, Singapore comes in at number 75 on this list. That's something that not many people know. You know, say, you know, again, I think a lot of Americans would say, hey, look at Singapore. It's a great country in Asia. It's developed tremendously. Look at the history of Singapore over the last 60 years. You know, that's because of democracy. Not necessarily true. Actually, Singapore, although a democracy, it is a limited democracy. And Singapore has been a one-party state since 1961. Or 1959, I believe it is. One of the two. But for the better part of, you know, six decades, it has been a one-party state. It has been the same political party that was instituted by Lee Kuan Yew. And Lee Kuan Yew is, is one of my favorite politicians of all time. He is an incredible visionary. And Lee Kuan Yew was not a fan of democracy. He did not. He spoke very negatively about it. He was educated in the UK. I believe he was educated at either Harvard or, um, uh, sorry, not Harvard, Oxford. Uh, obviously, Harvard in the United States. I believe, was, believe he was educated in Oxford. And very educated man. The interesting thing about Lee Kuan Yew is when he came out, he had the vision to transform the island nation of Singapore. And at the time, what he did is he said, we are going to make English the national language. And Singapore, for those of you that don't know, is very interesting because you have a very big diversity of cultures there. You obviously have a lot of ethnically Chinese people in Singapore. You have a lot of Malaysians. You have a lot of Indians. You have a plethora of different nationalities and cultures. Uh, you know, many Singaporeans speak, you know, three, four, five different dialects and languages. It's really, truly an incredible place. And to come out and say, we're going to speak English, this really caused a huge uproar in Singapore. Excuse me, I'm going to get some water. Many Chinese started revolting. They said, no, we're, we are ethnically Chinese. We want to read newspapers in, in Chinese. We want to speak Chinese. We, we, we want to have multiple languages. But again, Lee Kuan Yew is thinking, what's our nation going to be like 60 years from now when we are the only country in Asia that has democracy, you know, not democracy, the only that has English as the official language? <laughs> what an advantage that's going to be. And again, this is why you've seen such a competitive advantages for Singapore, one of the fastest growing regions in Asia, tremendous amount of business. And again, what an amazing government policy to have a pathway for home ownership. I think that's kind of more the issue that we're looking at in Hong Kong. You know, for example, I would like to see some economic reform happening in Hong Kong where these oligarchs cannot control all of this land. More public housing would be available. You know, pathways for home ownership for Hong Kong citizens would be established. I think that would create, you know, a lot of societal benefits. And these are probably the biggest issues that are facing Hong Kong right now. But again, it was amazed for me to go down to Occupy Central and I would talk to these students and a lot of them were, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old and none of them had any experience in the real world. Again, when you're 18 years old, what job have you had? A lot of these student protesters, you know, they were living at home with their parents. You know, they were, you know, again, they're living at home. You know, their expenses are being paid for by their parents. They're supposed to be going to university to get a better education, but no, they're skipping class and they're now protesting downtown. And they have this concept like, you know, we are changing the, the world. We are changing the world by protesting. 
And you saw a huge conflict because a lot of parents were speaking out, no, you're not changing the world. You're wasting your opportunity to get an education. I'm literally paying your bills. You have no experience in this world. Go out and get an education. At the same time, what you also saw is you saw a tremendous amount of businessmen. And I've spent some time in Hong Kong. And the interesting thing is, is when you see people that kind of understand it on a, on a bigger scale, you realize that Hong Kong people that really understand it realize that there's a tremendous opportunity for them to do business inside the country of, uh, you know, inside their home country of China. You know, Hong Kong is part of China and Hong Kong citizens have a unique advantage. You know, for example, Hong Kong citizens have the Hui Xiang Jin, which is the home return permit that they can travel back to China visa free at any time. You know, they can establish businesses in you know, China very easily, much easier than myself, for example, as an American citizen. And this is what you see a lot of Hong Kong citizens taking advantage of that, doing business and, and making money, doing well, you know, back in mainland China and really realizing the importance of that relationship with mainland China. And so again, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, we get into this big discussion, you know, what is the point of having this democracy? You know, is it going to bring the change in? Now, I have a question here, you know, do we actually think that if we bring democracy to China, is that going to guarantee a better future for China? Now, one of the things that, you know, I, I look at, I've, I've been investing in the stock market, for example, for over 15 years, and I, and I love analyzing companies and seeing their long-term growth prospects. And one of the things as an investor we always say is, you know, past results does not guarantee future success. However, when you're looking at certain successful companies, for example, you know, I've been a, a shareholder of Apple and Starbucks for well over a decade. And you look at these companies that are just very, very well established, having a very successful business plan. And you just know, you know, it's going to be just this continual compounding company that over the long term really does provide some great wealth as an investor and does really provide you some tangible benefits. You know, there, there are some you know, great companies in America and around the world for that matter that really provide some great opportunities. Now, again, I've used this analogy as well is that I believe that China's government functions more like a business. And again, you can see this very clearly in how the government and how the state comes out with these, you know, five-year plans. China is currently in its 15th, I'm sorry, 14th consecutive five-year plan. This is a really interesting thing. And because again, Five-year plans, you have a complete direction that you are trying to go. We know that China started its now 14th consecutive five-year plan. They have now a tangible goal in front of them to reach by the year 2025. Now, the United States, for example, I believe that this is one of the, the most difficult things in our democracy is the fact that you, you can never really plan long-term. And again, we have, for example, Joe Biden won the election. And, and again, for and again, this is something that we see with 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 um, America's problem with democracy right now. Sometimes I'll get some haters on here that say my president lives in Florida still. And when they when they say that, that simply means that Joe Biden didn't win the election. Donald Trump is still president. And again, if you're an American and you believe that you're not believing in democracy either, because if you believe that Joe Biden didn't win the election, you're not believing in a free and open democracy. So again, this is where we come into this really big problem, again, where people are saying, you know, it's like, how does the United States travel around the world spreading our democracy when we have our own citizens who don't believe we're democratic? Uh, I mean, take a look at this poll. This is an interesting article that came out. The United States is seen as a bigger threat to democracy than Russia or China, the global poll finds. Okay. Now this is a, this is a sample. This is, this is from 53 countries around the world. And that, that's, again, this is some really some red flags for me as an American, more looking at the fact that I think we need to change. We need to take a look at American democracy. And again, this is why I always say my message as an American, I am a concerned American citizen. I do love my country. I want us to be a little bit more selfish, a little bit more focusing inward. How are we going to fix this? Because again, even economists, the world economists, when they're analyzing countries around the world, we are known that we are not a full democracy. We are a flawed democracy. We have some very big issues. The other thing about that is, let's bring up that graph one more time to talk about what is exactly a flawed democracy. The big thing that we saw in here is media freedom infringement. 
okay? So we have a huge infringement on, on media. Now, I want to talk about how, why I think talking about a democracy in 2021 has changed so much over the past few decades, because democracy, it has changed a lot. Let me give you an example. You know, when we brought up that that graph again, and when I, when I bring up the graph showing what the world was like in 1977, okay, we saw the majority of countries around the world was not democratic. Again, in 1977, things were a lot more simple. And what you saw back in 1977, especially even in the United States, is you saw, I think, the political system and our media was very different back then. For example, back in the 1970s, 80s, and even early 1990s in America, when you presented one hour of news, you very much had to have a balanced reporting, okay? You had to have, you know, 30 minutes of presented from the conservative side and 30 minutes presented from the liberal side. You had to have both sides presented inside, you know, any kind of news channel. It had to be balanced. It had to be fair. And I think this is a good policy because, again, one of the one of the problems is is that you can go too far down the line of one political side, where you know you were just brainwashed by one political party, and and this is exactly what we've seen inside the United States of America. Now, the interesting thing about this was, I believe it was Newt Gingrich, who was the Speaker of the House back in the early 1990s. He came out with the idea, saying, "You know what we should do? Why don't we?" Why don't we come out and we get rid of that rule? Let's let if you, let's have ultimate freedom on media. So if you want to just be completely right, you can be completely right. If you want to be completely left, you can be completely left. And we are going to abolish that rule in our media that you have to present the the you know both sides of the story. Um, guys, I want to take a moment here. We've just passed over seven hundred people in the stream, which is fantastic. I'm re really appreciative of all the support. Great to see here. Um, and I just noticed that Jayo, Matt from the Jayo Nation, hey, Cyrus, surprised you're streaming now. Yeah, buddy, I, I like to start my weekends early in the morning. You know, I'm a morning guy. Um, many of you know I've got three small children, so this is just the perfect time for me. I like to get up and get a lot of, you know, um, my, especially when I do a lot of my work early in the mornings. I usually get up between 4.35 a.m. every morning uh, here in Canada to do a lot of my work in the morning. But yeah, so I'm, we're talking about democracy. We're talking about um uh, China, we got a message here. I'm going to take a look at the comment section. I, sometimes I get in a roll. I, I don't see some of the comments coming in. Um, what is one that I just saw? Um, <clears throat> Cyrus, you need to have a better shirt on. Good guy, good idea. Actually, you're right. It doesn't look too good on camera. I like that. Thanks for the feedback. Um, so anyways, but notice how that shifted. Let's get back on topic here. I'm on a roll here. Is In the 1990s, the United States government changed that fact. And they they, they said, okay, now media channels can present only one side of the story. And this is exactly what we've seen. We've seen Fox News and CNN now go to the extremes. And this has been my biggest concern. And then you throw in, okay, in 2007, 2008, the invention of social media. Okay, when I went to China in 2007, we really didn't have social media back then, okay? You had the Facebook, the Facebook, as it was called back then. And it was more of a, it was a very different social media experience at Facebook back then. I mean, you had it as a way to, you know, you used to join these groups and it was just very different. You know, advertising on Facebook wasn't a big thing. You know, it was very, you know, even, I don't even think Facebook was monetizing, to be honest, back in 2006, 2007. I'm not entirely sure on that, but it was very different than it is today. But again, this is the, this is the difference here, okay, is that because we got rid of that law, you now have media channels ba basically being able to say whatever they want to see. And I think this is a very dangerous thing inside America because, for example, I've shared with this on the channel, I actually come from a very ultra-conservative, pro-Christian base in Orlando, Florida. And when I, like, for example, so everybody in my high school, everyone in my hometown, everybody in my Facebook friends, they very much are the pro-Trump community. And so when I would log into my Facebook, it is entirely pro-Trump. And the problem is, is that you have everybody is watching Fox News religiously. Everybody is only retweeting stuff from, from the Trump side. And so you have a very interesting take on how they see, um, you know, the election and, and, and the politics and the policies. And, and the problem is, is that I've had, I've seen friends in our circle where somebody has switched over to the, to the left. You know, they've gone a little bit more, more liberal in their thinking. 
And, and a, you know, a Trump supporter will say, well, you're not my friend anymore. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. And friendships have been broken. Families have been broken. And I think this is really difficult. You know, I have, you know, I'm a Christian. I have friends that are atheists. I have no problem with that. I have friends that are liberals. I never really want to let politics, you know, get into that. And, and just for clear record, you know, I'm not, my view on, I'm kind of confused on what view I am because I don't really identify with either the Republican or the Democratic Party right now. And this is something that I'm advocating for. If there's ever been a time for a third party in the United States of America, we most definitely desperately need that right now in the United States of America. Because I feel that there is a majority of Americans who kind of feel like myself. I, I like things from both sides, you know, from the Republican and from the and from the Democratic Party. And this is where you're torn in the middle because at the ultimate day, you like si you like things from both sides, but you have to choose one. And it's a very difficult decision. So, you know, and I think and that's what you see a lot of people, for example, a lot of people were saying, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden, not necessarily because I like Joe Biden, but I just don't like Trump. And this is how a lot of people, you know, were voting that way as well. So again, th th this is really a big thing in why the United States is a flawed democracy is because of our media. Social media has has changed the game. You know, our world has completely shifted in the last 10 years. Look at how much social media changes and influences things. And again, I've, I've mentioned this several times on the channel before. If you've ever watched the movie, The Social Dilemma, this is a, I think it's a must watch movie because it talks about the dangers of cell phone addiction, the dangers of social media. And it is ironic because I am a content creator. So, you know, I do feel it is it is an interesting one because I am here on YouTube and building, you know, I do have multiple social media channels. And, you know, I, I do try to be very objective and very fair. And again, my, as you guys know, my goal is always to preach cooperation and learning to work together. But it, it is, it's really difficult when you have, the ability to manipulate people through social media, you know, and, and so anyways, this is, this is something that we really need to pay attention to. So this, this is, these are some of the challenges that we are facing in the, in the United States with our democracy. Um, I want to give a little side note here to, uh, Bay, uh, Bay Ray, uh, send in a little chat. You are amazing sticker. Bay Ray, always a great supporter. I think a Patreon subscriber and a big supporter of the live streams as well. So just want to thank you guys for the continued support and being here. And again, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're, you know, consistently staying at over 700 people joining us here live. This is fantastic. I want to thank you all for coming in and spending some time with me as we get the weekend started wherever you are in the world. And yeah, so anyways, I wanted to, you know, just talk about these things. I think I've, you know, I, I think I've pretty much hit all of the topics that I want to discuss so much today. Let's, let's open it up to some questions here. I, I kind of want to cap this at one hour today. So let's open this up to some some questions. Uh, hey, Cyrus, could you share your thoughts on the G7 summit yesterday? Um, I need to I need to do a little bit more research on that. I have not had a chance to go through everything there, so I can't publicly make a comment on that. 40% um, of people in America trust their own government. This is a big interesting thing. I mean, I remember Donald Trump sent out a tweet where he said 52% approval rating you know, thank you, America. Thank you for making me a successful president, something along those lines. And you kind of scratch your head when, you know, obviously Donald Trump thinks that's a great result for him to tweet that. But 52%, let's just be honest, you know, that approval rating would not succeed if you were a politician in China. And th this is one of the things where I think that we can learn from both systems. So th this is this is what I want America to learn, for example, from China's system. I would love to see America have embrace a little bit more meritocracy in their system. For example, I think if you're going to be the United States president, I think you should have some qualifications. I think that you should have, you know, you, you need to have a little bit more experience inside the political system. You need to have more experience, a proven track record of success, whether that's, you know, you start off as a governor, you then move on to being a senator. You know, I think that would be a really good system to have a little bit more experience in there. Now, I, I don't think that'll ever happen because, again, the, this is kind of one of this is one of the best things about democracy. Democracy, we sell a dream. We sell this dream, and this dream is is that anybody can grow up to be the president of the United States. And I've I've heard many people say I've heard, I've, heard, I've heard this, and this maybe I'll go on record here saying that you know Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, he he would be a great American president. I've heard many Americans say that. And, and the sense is that he's, I think he has 
probably the most Instagram followers. You know, he has incredible social media appeal, but he's he's well liked by people around the world. You know, maybe we need a celebrity to be this. This this is the mindset of some Americans. And it's kind of scary when you I've talked this about this with some Canadian friends here, and it's like, why would you think that a, a, a movie star would be a successful president? And I said, well, you know, when you think about it from the sense of, you know, just being a celebrity and and, and being a good image of America. You know, I, I mean, from a from a PR perspective, you could potentially market that. And we also know that the United States president, for example, it's not just one person governing the country. Obviously, you know, like Donald Trump, Donald Trump had zero political experience. He became the president. And then, of course, he filled in his cabinets and he had an entire team behind him. So it's not like it's one person running the country. There's many people behind him, you know, but this is just an interesting thing where you where you have, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger becoming the governor of California. You had, you know, another uh, former wrestler becoming the governor of Minnesota. You have these former celebrities becoming these politicians in America. You could potentially see that. Donald Trump has certainly opened the door and has certainly made that argument that there is no need for political experience, you know, to become a politician in America. But I think it's important. I, I would personally like to see that. And I think as, again, one of the things that I want people to understand about China, and I've, I've highlighted this in my previous video is that China is constantly changing. And I, and I do see an instance, for example, you know, for, I, I do see that maybe there is more democratic principles that are implemented inside the country of China. The interesting thing though, is that not a lot of people understand this. There are over 2000 local villages in China that have implemented local voting. And I think one of the other interesting things, I do want to hit on this point I forgot to talk about, is that China is such a different country than the United States of America. And one of the things, one of the biggest challenges that China faces is the fact that it is has it has so much diversity with inside their country. For example, when you look at the United States, we have 50 states. Everybody speaks English. Pretty much you can travel anywhere in the United States. It's going to be very similar culture. It's not that different. Sure, New York's going to be different from Texas. There's going to be some cultural differences there. But let's say 99% of things, it's, you know, you're American. It's not that different. In, in China, it's actually very different. And, and I think this is really interesting when you look at, for example, the provinces of Xinjiang and Tibet. You know, these are, these obviously are parts of China. And but the culture there is very different. They have their own local culture, which is actually beautiful. And they have their own local language, which is being embraced and being continued. The the hard thing that many people don't understand is, is that when China comes out and says, Inner Mongolia, Tibet, Xinjiang, all of you must learn Mandarin, people come out and say, Well, you're eroding the local language. No, they're not. Actually, if you travel there, you know, the Uyghur language, the Tibetan language, the Inner Mongolian, the Mongolian language, there's over 300 dialects spoken all around China. And the dialects vary. You know, I remember being in Shanghai, obviously speaking Shanghainese, you know, people speak Shanghainese there. You know, you travel 30 minutes by train over to Suzhou, they speak Suzhounese, you know, and then you travel another 30 minutes and it's a, a little bit different form of, di of a dialect there. There's hundreds of dialects going on. And you know, this is something that is just very foreign concept to most Americans to understand in the sense that China has, it's very difficult. How do you manage this? How do you manage a country of 1.4 billion people? You know, I don't, I don't believe that democracy would be the best thing for, you know, a full democracy would be the best thing for that. I think when you look at China as well, it, it is quite interesting. And I, and I wanted to share this is, I'm going to end this. This is quite powerful because I recently read a blog post from World Affairs. I believe it's worldaffairs.blog. And this gentleman has written several books about China. I read, I read really an amazing, really a fa fascinating insight into this. And uh, and and I'm going to be quoting a lot of things from this article. but So I'm going to be reading a little bit to you. But just pay attention to what this article says here. China disavowed the communist model 40 years ago. Uh, China's contemporary economy is modeled actually after Germany's 19th century system, which could be described as state capitalism. Now, this is a really interesting thing, and, and this is why I really like to go back and learn about history, because you can learn from the mistakes, but you also learn about you know how these countries developed and how they are. Now, for example, when you look at the empires of Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, and the UK, they became very, very wealthy over the centuries 
by be, you know, with their colonial past. They expanded across the world. They had different colonies. For example, Portugal colonized, you know, the city of Macau. We know the UK has colonized all around the world. I mean, you know, the UK had a tremendous colony all, you know, you know, for, for many years, you know, much of the world was colonized by the UK, France as well, you know, the Netherlands as well, Spain as well. Germany never had that. So Germany was actually in a very big disadvantage. So this was really interesting. Back in the 17 and 1800s, Germany was extremely poor. And the problem was, is all these other countries that were colonizing around the world, you know, they were looting gold and silver and they were, you know, colonizing and, and they were doing all of these conquests around the world. That's how they became very wealthy. Now, at the time, what happened was, is because Germany was so poor, a lot of young Germans were starting to immigrate and they started immigrating to America, for example. And this is why you see, you know, a lot of old German immigration, you know, you know, many years ago, my, actually my um, great grandfather from my father's side immigrated from Germany and my mother is a German national. So I'm very heavy on the German ancestry, but it's very interesting to note this, you know, Germany, you don't see German colonies around the world. Now the Germany actually had to think of a solution. We have a problem. We're very poor. Our youngest minds are leaving Germany. All of our countries around surrounding us in Europe are much more powerful and strong. How are we going to compete with them? This is what Germany did is they actually said, we're going to invest industrial socialism or, or what we can call state capitalism. And this is what they did. What they did is that the government took on some of the capitalist biggest burdens. And so, for example, what they did is they started, the government started investing in all of the infrastructure. Okay? And it started paying for infrastructure, for salaries, for basically all of the commodity prices. For example, if you wanted to manufacture things in Germany, the government would subsidize that for you. And in addition to that, it started, um, so here we go, the government subsidized and took ownership of basic things such as infrastructure, mining, transportation, electricity, water. Now, all of a sudden, all of this is being paid for by the German government. In addition to that, they it, that started lowering the cost of living in Germany, and then they started offering free education. Now, when Germany started edu you know implementing this free education, it was really a win-win for everybody because number one, the society in Germany was being educated for free, so you had a workforce that was being educated. Not only that, companies were starting to employ people that had your education, which was really a very big concept back in the 1800s, as you can imagine. Now, as a result of these you know, socialist programs, Germany was actually became the first country in the world to offer universal health care. And they did that in 1883. That's something that, you know, not a lot of people know. And this is really interesting. Again, how was, was Germany able to, you know, revise their economy and become this very, very important country again in Europe? You know, they couldn't go out and colonize, so they had to come from within. And this is, again, just to recap how they did this, they said, okay, we're the state. We are now going to take this burden off of you. If you're trying to start a company, you have a tremendous amount of capital expenses to get that business going. We're going to take care of that for you. We're then going to educate everybody for free, and we're going to provide you pathways. Now, by doing all of this, then Germany was starting to innovate, and they started to really be able to produce. Now, in order to pay for this, taxes went up through the roof. And instead of, for example, you know, before taxes were 10%, they raised up to 50%. Now you're thinking to yourself, gee, many Christmas, you know, that's a five times increase on taxes. But think about in this stand standpoint, would you rather pay 20, would you rather pay 10% on $20 or would you rather pay 50% on $200? That puts things into perspective. You, you know, if you're making a ton more money, pay them, pay more tax. You know, it's, it's always, it's like investing in the stock market. For example, people are like, you know, should I sell this stock, you know, to, to, you know, avoid taxes. If you're paying taxes on stocks, you're doing good. You know, that means that you're doing good. You know, shouldn't be fearing paying taxes. And so again, a lot of people saw, you know, people in Germany were paying 50% tax, but they were making 10 times much money as before. It was actually working out for them. So again, um, and again, this is an interesting system. When I said earlier in the stream, when you travel around the world and you're observing countries around the world, when I, when I travel to these countries in Scandinavia that are ranking number one on the democracy scale, their taxes are 40, 50%. And again, you have very similar things where the government subsidizes everything, everything from health and education and, you know, long-term care as an elderly, all the things are subsidized from the government. It's a very interesting model. So let me tell, let me give you an example of how this is working inside of China. For example, China 
supplements many of the state-owned enterprises. They supplement things like cutting-edge internet technology. Now, for example, this is really a, a, a double benefit, not only for these internet companies inside of China, but also for citizens. For example, uh, in China, you can be streaming 5G internet in China. Well, it, what, what, let's go to the comment section. What does is, what is that cost in China? You know, anybody that's living in China right now, I, I think it's something like 10 bucks a month, I'm going to say. I mean, it's no more than 20 US dollars a month for your, you know, for your unlimited data, whatever it's going to cost you in, um, you know, in China. You know, internet in, in Asia very much is extremely inexpensive. Now, I'm going to tell you, you know, for example, the interesting thing is when I came from, when I came from China and I, and I came to live in Canada, the cost of internet and the cost of cell phones here in Canada is absorbent. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable. I'm thinking I'm paying something close to like 300 Canadian dollars a month for my wife and I cell phone bill. And I think we get, you know, like 20 gigs of data a month. You know, I mean, it's really expensive because Canada is a very big country. It's essentially the same size as China and the United States. The problem is, is that it only has, you know, a 10th of the population of America. So you have, you know, you have to have this, this huge network, but you don't have a lot of people paying for it. So of course the cost is going to be more. Now, the interesting thing in China, let's go back to that illustration here, is that China comes out and they are now going to be supplementing, you know, these cutting edge internet companies. And as a result of this, what you can see is, is you can see now China has the ability, its companies have the ability to innovate. And this is why you see China on the forefront of internet technology, why they have invented 5G, why 5G is available all across the country. Somebody in the comments said, look, Internet here, I don't know what it costs, but it's very inexpensive and you can access it in the countryside. And again, this is really important thing when you look at how are we going to get people out of, um, you know, poverty, you know, in, in China. One of the successful things that have done is that is through this live streaming, you know, through, you know, allowing farmers to live stream and sell vegetables. I know, you know, Matt and the Barretts, for example, I know that they went to this very small village in China. And I, and I think it's awesome because you have... For example, an older Chinese gentleman in his 50s or 60s, five years ago, this guy would have never even owned a smartphone. Now he's on Douyin or Kuaishou or whatever Chinese social media network he is. He's streaming in 5G. He's become a little bit of an internet celebrity, maybe in his local region. And the guy's selling you know, vegetables, whatever it is. That's a really unique story. And again, he's doing it through these e-commerce sites like Alibaba, JD, you know, things, WeChat, all of these things have really revolu revolutionized things. But again, if China's government didn't get behind these, these you know, state-owned enterprises and begin, begin again, get behind these companies to really, you know, help reduce the cost and spur innovation, you wouldn't have seen that. And so again, this is how China's model works very differently. I'm going to go back and we're going to talk about for example, um, in America, we have something called the FIRE economy. That is finance, insurance, and real estate. Finance, insurance, and real estate. And, and this is really how America's system is going. As you see, these are the main things that are driving the American economy. You know, for example, one of the big things, as we know, the United States does not offer universal health care coverage, universal health insurance. Now, here in Canada, where I'm currently living, that is a principle. Now, it's funny. This is a huge cultural difference between Canadians and Americans. Canadians can't really wrap their heads around how, the, how do you guys not have universal health care in America? You know, how is that possible? And the thing about it is, is because it's too lucrative. It's, it's too lucrative because hospitals make a ton of money. Insurance companies make a ton of money. The medical system, big pharma makes a tremendous amount of money. These are tremendous drivers of the United States economy. Um, insurance industry, tremendous, tremendously popular on Wall Street. Um, real estate, casinos. These are, these are really the main. So again, the fire economy, these are the main factors that are driving the American economy. But again, when you're not investing in infrastructure, and you know e-commerce, all of these big things that, that are not being influenced from the government, you, you are more subjecting yourself to these big cycles. And this is why we see the United States economy up and down, up and down, boom and bust, boom and bust. You have a very cyclical thing. You know, we have not seen the same in China. Okay. We, you know, China has not had a huge economic depression. For example, I was living in China in 2008 and 9 
during the world financial crisis. And China saw a, you know, certainly a, a dip, but it was not this plummet that you saw. Even 2020, you know, you saw US economies, everything just plummet. You know, you saw China stay very stable, actually grow a very little bit of percentage. So you have a, a very different system. And I think this is something that, you know, can't be ignored. Um, Everybody, we're, come, we're so excited to be streaming here. We just reached, I uh, just saw 888, 888 people here in the stream with us here today. Um, fantastic. Um, that, obviously, 888, great number for China. Uh, very honored that you, you would all choose to spend your weekend here with me. We have, uh, I love this, Aloha from Hawaii. Um, I agree with you, but why are you moved from Canada? Why did you move from Canada to China? I've made a video about that. You can search that. I'll, I'll let you just watch that video. It's easier. Um, uh, to I'll sum it up in one sentence. The, this, the, the reason I left Canada was was opportunity. I had an opportunity to come here. I'm an expat. I've traveled around the world. I, I go wherever there's opportunities. I had a, a unique opportunity here in Canada that I wanted to take advantage of. Also, you know, in the future, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe one day we do move back to the United States as I want to be a little bit closer to my parents as they continue to to age and maybe be a little bit closer to them. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's. I think I think to be honest is a, is a choice between good and good. I, I loved my life in China. Uh, I thought it was. A, 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 I think China is a fantastic country. The the level of safety that you enjoy as an expat there, the amount of business opportunity that is there is fantastic. But Canada is also a fantastic country. So I, I think it's a choice between between good and good. And I think the United States still very great country. You know, there certainly has its issues as all countries do. But I think that you know we really we really need to look at. You know, I, I do get that question a lot. You know, why did you leave? Well, you know, it's a choice between good and good. And I made a video about that. You can watch that for more in-depth analysis on that. Now, again, this is main, the main thing that I really wanted to talk about and, and why we're talking about democracies. And again, why I think China's model is is really interesting. And and this is something that I, we're going to come to the, kind of the conclusion of the stream. I, I've always been very keen in learning as much as I can from different countries. And I think if you come out with the opinion that China's evil, China's bad, everything that China's doing is wrong, I don't think that you have actually given China, allowed them to present their side of the story. And I think if you, and, I, and I've made this point before, if you analyze China from the eyes of a Westerner, you will never be able to understand it because China doesn't make sense. And I'll give you a really interesting story. I was actually uh, spending time with my neighbor yesterday, who's a Canadian man, and he his wife is from Australia. And every year they would go back to Australia and they would fly through Hong Kong to get there. And he grew up here in Canada, and he and you know there's a large Asian community here in, in the area where I live in Vancouver. And he said, you know, Cyrus, growing up, I never understood China, and I certain and I never understood Hong Kong, and I didn't get it until I actually went there. For example. You know, sometimes people here, you know, you know, they can be a little bit rude. For example, if you're in a crowded area, they'll kind of just give you the shoulder and bust through. And I was like, hey, you know, why are you so rude? You know, we're in Canada. We don't do that here. You should be respectful. And I always kind of thought Chinese people were rude. And then what I did is I flew back to, I flew to Hong Kong and I started taking the metro system. And I'm like, wow, they're not rude. It's just, that's, that's kind of just the way life is. Like you are jammed on the Metro. You kind of need to budge through sometimes. It's, it's not, they're not trying to purposely hit me. They're not trying to purposely be mean. It is just a, a different culture because in Canada, you have a plethora of personal space. If you're living in a city like Hong Kong or Shanghai, Beijing, all of us have been in the Metro systems there, you know, personal space is not guaranteed. In fact, it's very little seen there. So again, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing unless you have been there and spent some time you know, inside the country, you are not going to understand it at all. And so, you know, I think when you when you hear people that say, Cyrus, if China were to embrace one man, one vote, it would then succeed, you know, as a country. Well, I have to be honest with you. Let's just look at it objectively. China's achieved a tremendous amount of success over the past 40 years. China's government has revolutionized the quality of life you know, for, for everybody, I mean, for really for everybody, everybody, no matter where you are on the spectrum in China, you have been able to see an increase. And this is something that, you know, for example, uh, I know, um, you know, many people, many of the other China vloggers have talked about, you know, is just seeing this, you know, again, if you're 40 years old in China, 50 years old, you have seen a tremendous transformation in China, or, you know, from compared from your childhood to right now. 
And this is tangible benefits. When you look at a country like China that has avoided war over the past 40 years and is in, instead investing into its greatest asset itself, its citizens, its country, building infrastructure, this is again why you're seeing China continue to improve. I mean, by the year 2032, I believe there's going to be 50,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. And China's, you know, China's goal is to make sure that every... I think it's every village or every city with a population of at least 500,000 people is directly connected to the high-speed rail. So they're essentially going to have every, almost every place in China is going to be accessible by high-speed rail. Now that costs China a tremendous amount of money to develop. But again, you know, what's in the best long-term interest of the country and its citizens? You know, the United States, we can't get any of that, those projects done. We have, you know, if you travel to our airports, you know, um, I had an Australian friend say, look, New York LaGuardia Airport, it's a third world country. That airport is an absolute disaster. And it's and it's very difficult when you hear, you know, I've had Chinese nationals fly in and say, you know, wow, um, this is America? Like this is your first perception of America is flying into New York Airport or Boston or Chicago? I mean, it's just, you have this perception of what America is. And a lot of times it's very different. And, and again, I'm not trying to say that America is bad. I mean, there's so many amazing things in America but it, it is just very different. And so I, 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 I really love, um, I think Matt, if you're still in the, Matt from Jayo Nation, if you're still in the live stream, um, you know, Matt came out on a live stream the other day and he said something that I thought was really brilliant. I want to share that. And that is the fact that if you were going to go down to the path of going to the far extreme to hating China and really putting out some very, you know, negative content about China, you owe it to yourself to go to the China and actually travel and experience it. Because I do know that there's a lot of people that do not, that have never even been to China or have very little experience in China. And you have to put yourself inside the eyes of the average Chinese person. I think if we look at China, you know, Chinese society, you are going to be focusing on what is the most important elements for you, okay? And I believe that if you ask the majority of Chinese people, what they're wanting to see is, I want stability in my life. I want to make sure that my children have a better future than me. I want to make sure that they have a good job, access to a better education. And I think if you look at what China's doing, they are prioritizing these areas. I have some videos in the pipeline that's going to continue to explain this. For example, next, um, next week, we're going to do a video with Baidu. And Baidu is taking 15% of profits and reinvesting into programs to help train the next generation of AI, artificial intelligence engineers. They are investing in the future generation, training these people up. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I had somebody point out to me, for example, you know, that, 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 there's, that there's not enough high schools in Shenzhen, you know, that there, there's a lot of people that don't have placement. That's something the government needs to address. I mean, obviously, I believe that's a priority. You're going to see more and more pressure. You know, for example, we had the Gaokao, which is the, you know, that is the national test in China that basically admits you into college. It is a national test and it lasting anywhere from two to four days, depending on your region in China. That was just this past week. And it is the single most important test in a Chinese person's life. A lot of pressure with the Gaokao, tremendous pressure on that. But you're, you're going to need to see, you know, China continue to evolve and change. But I think that's the one thing that China has been able to do much easier than the United States of America, at being able to address whatever issues they are. For example, I'm not saying that China's system is perfect. You know, there is tremendous issues that do need to be solved. But when you talk about, for example, the pathway to these education and reducing poverty and, you know, how infrastructure is being built, that most certainly is being prioritized and is and continuing to improve on a, you know, yearly basis. I think it was interesting. I remember I was watching Daniel's, Daniel Dumrell's video when he went to Xinjiang and he said, you know, there was an issue with the local people there. They were not getting, you know, healthy drinking water. And the government realized this, and they had a timetable for this water filtration system to be built in 24 months. But because the outcry was there, and because people said, "Look, we, you know, this water is not functioning for us," you know what? Instead of 24 months, we're going to we're going to prioritize that, and we are going to make it now eight months. It contrast that here in Canada, we have Indigenous First Nations. You know, the First Nations are the Indigenous people here that, that you know that have had problems for decades getting water you know, decades because Canada's government cannot 
you know, allocate the right money for that. Interesting thing, and I know many of you have seen this in the past few months, uh, sorry, past few weeks, there were 215 remains of indigenous children found buried in a, in a private school here in British Columbia. Now, this was a horrific thing that happened. Obviously, this was in the past when, you know, Canada has some very difficult, very difficult times. It was very difficult to, to make this discovery. It's obviously a huge loss of face for Canada, as many people around the world always think of, you know, Canada as this friendly nation and this democratic nation. And as, but as a result of that, the, Justin Trudeau said, well, we, we, we were going to allocate $10 million to the, to these, in, in, you know, first nations people. We're now going to double that to 20 million. And it was going to take two years to get that implemented, but now we're going to speed that up and try to get it to you within a year, which, which is better, but still it's like, you can see the inefficiencies there. And, and, and again, it's also sad. It's like, so if we didn't make that discovery of 215 dead, you know, uh, children, you know, would, would have that happened? You know, would, would he have seen, you know, would you have accelerated it? It's almost like, okay, you know, I, I've lost some face here. I'm just going to try to do my best to rectify the situation. But that should have been implemented before. You know, that should have been implemented before. And that's that. So again, this is where we are really, you know, why, why I think that every country has a unique set of differences and every country really needs to figure out what's best for them. I think that China is going to continue to evolve I think that the United States and other democratic nations are going to continue to evolve. Your society should be continuing to evolve. But when you go back to, you know, I think if you go to China, and this is this is something that I'm going to do when I go back to China is do some more street interviews. What I would like to see for any of the China vloggers out there, I, I would love to see street interviews with people, you know, just saying, look, what's your opinion as a local Chinese? Do you feel you know, that what's, what's your opinion? What, how do you feel that the Chinese government has taken care of you? How do you feel of Chinese government and their ability to offer you a brighter future? I think I would say, I would go on record to say that you're going to have more Chinese, the higher percentage of Chinese have more optimism and more faith in their government to provide them a better future. Let's say five, 10 years out than you do the United States. Cause I know for a fact that in America, we have, we have so much, many people that are saying, look, I, I've just, I don't have a lot of confidence in my government right now, and we really need to change things up. So again, as I mentioned earlier in the live stream, I want to see American government be a little bit more selfish. Stop looking at other countries around the world. You always say America first should be the best foreign policy. How about you make America first the best domestic policy? Let's focus on our thing. But again, you know, somebody's asking, will they really speak frankly? Will they do it? I don't think they will. And this is the reason why. Because there's so much corruption inside America's government. And we always talk about corruption. And the thing is, is that corruption is legalized in America. It's legalized by lobbyists. And this was really one of the, the, the defining, the changing moment for me as an American citizen happened in 2017 when my home state was devastated by a massive gun shooting down in South Florida. This was at uh, Majority Douglas School. There were 17 children that were gunned down, killed. And these students said, you know what? It, enough is enough. I'm absolutely sick and tired of this BS. We are going to take to Washington and we are going to demand gun change. Now, Marco Rubio, the senator of Florida, went on stage and, and he was confronted one-on-one -on -one by these students. And they said, stand on the stage right now and promise to us that you will never take another dollar from the National Rifle Association. Take another to make a stand right now that you were going to actually make some damn change that we need in America. How many more children are going to be gunned down in our schools? And he stuttered and he said, well, you know, I think it's important that we realize that the Second Amendment is a very important concept in America. I am most definitely going to try to do the best job that I can do as a politician of the United States of America, a land of freedom and democracy. You talk, you can talk, bull, you know, BS all you want. You know, at the end of the day, he dodged the question. You go back and you look at it. In his career, he's accepted over $3 million from the National Rifle Association. There is no way Marco Rubio can run his campaign as a politician unless he gets that money. I'm sorry. It's all about the Benjamins. And this is what you see in America. And this is, this is why it's really hard to be independent because you need money. You have to have money to become a politician in America. And this is, this is why, now again, like I, I'm not saying that we need to ban guns in America. I, I, I do support the second amendment in America, simply in the fact that I know that you're never going to change that. 
that that is it. But for example, when somebody says, "Hey, I think we should institute some policies," for example, that maybe you shouldn't have semi-automatic ri raf you know, rifles. Why do we have these weapons of mass destruction? You want to talk about weapons of mass destruction? It's having civilians having semi-automatic rifles that can just mow down people. There's no point for a civilian to own an, a, 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 a weapon that can do that. I, I really don't see any purpose of that. That is that should be that should be in the hands of people in the military designed for combat. You know, if you want to own a rifle for hunting or for protection, that's fine. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with owning a handgun. But it's difficult when you have these guns that can really kill a lot of people in a very short amount of time. So again, this this is the problem. And but I think you know, again, we have this optimism that hopefully in America we can one day bring change. And I think that is the biggest thing that democracy is. That is most definitely the best thing that democracy offers its citizens is hope. It might never it might never come, but hopefully there is. My hope, for example, for 2024, I'm really hoping that we get two young candidates from the Republican and the Democratic side that can really challenge you know, the norm. I, I mean, we know for a fact Joe Biden's not going to be running for a second term. I don't think he can make it. But I think, I mean, are we going to see him pass the ta the torch to Kamala and let her run, become the first female president? You know, um, you know, what are we going to see here? Um, <clears throat> here we go. First question: Why do they sell guns at Walmart or Kmart? It's America, baby. We love it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. That's a simple answer there. Uh, Tommy, thank you for the super chat. Thanks for all you do. Jayo. Yes, we will continue to Jayo. Guys, we've reached over 960 people in the channel here. I love spending time with you guys. Uh, again, I'm going to continue to do the live streams because um, as a content creator that is spending so much of my day studying and researching and analyzing, consulting about China, you know, I, I want to, I, I, I read, I consume so much information. So for for me, it's great to just come on here and have uh, a little bit of a chat and hear with you. Um, yeah, Biden's health is taking a toll since he took office. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, the United States president, hardest job in the world. No doubt about it. Um, absolutely. I would love to tune to see a different point of view. Mango Press, is this on? I'm not sure. Thanks for the content, the live streams. You should do this more often. I'm going to try to commit to doing twice a week, guys, you know, because I really want to make sure that, um, you know, you know, that we, you know, that we can, can have this interaction in here. Somebody's asked a question about Serpent ZA. Uh, you know, I, I, I really don't like to get into politics or to drama. You know, I, I'm not, I'm going to have no comment on, on him. You know, I'm going to just say like, you know, you do you, you do me. You know, like, uh, you know, I've had some interactions with him on, on Twitter. And, you know, I, I think actually, to be honest, we kind of came to the conclusion. It's like, you know, look, I'm about building bridges. And, you know, he said, look, I'm about building bridges. And I think it's basically like, I guess we have different ways of building bridges. I'm just going to leave it at that. No other, no other really comments need to be made on that. I'm going to be focusing. The only person that I can control in this world is myself. The only content that I can control is my content. The only channel that I can control is Cyrus Jansen's channel. And so again, I'm trying to do my best to be a positive light in this world. This is the way that I see it. So I'm not going to comment on anybody else's channel, uh, regardless if they're pro-China, anti-China, whatever it is. You know, you do you, I do me. So let's just, you know, I'm going to try to be that change that I want to see in the world. And I know for a fact, and I truly believe this in my heart of hearts, that a, that a, a relationship with China most definitely is going to be the best future for the world. And I, I have some exciting interviews. So I guess that we're going to end the stream here. Where I'm going to tell you some couple of things with some things that I've got in the pipeline right now. I'm going to be releasing this video tonight. Okay. So this is my next video. Here is the thumbnail for that. Can, Ameri can Americans understand China? This is a 13 minute video. This is going to be, this is the thumbnail here image. And so get a little bit of a preview for everybody that's on the live stream this morning. I'm going to be launching this in roughly um, just under 12 hours time. So this is going to be coming out if you're uh, if you're here in North America, that's going to be coming out at 9 p.m. on the East Coast, 6 p.m. here on the West Coast. That of course will be on Sunday morning, 9 9 a.m. So make sure you come back and check the channel uh, later today, wherever you are in the world. You're going to be able to see this new video. I'm very excited for this video because it, you know I, I want to present things from you know I, I believe that the vast majority of Americans fail to understand China. And I'm going to be presenting two main reasons why I believe that to be true in this video. I'm excited for you guys to watch that. And I'd love to hear your comments on that. Um, so make sure you watch that. I, I've, I'm, I'm reaching out to um, a couple of, I'm really excited about my Real Talk China series. And I, I, I want to say thank you to everybody who has been supporting the latest video with that, which has been talking about digital currency. We did an episode with Richard Turin 
And I really want to support, I really want to say thank you for the great support. That video was able to reach over 100,000 views. And I think it's interesting because I know that it, it was a 45 minute video. It's on a very specific business topic, but this is something that I really have a passion for is trying to share, you know, that this is kind of my angle. If I can show you some of the interesting things that China is innovating and how American businesses are doing business in China and, and how they're going to sh shift the future of our world, I think that we can convince more people of having a better relationship with China. And again, I'm not trying to say that the United States needs to be best friends and we're going to be, we're going to become the closest allies in the world. You know, but there is another thing that I learned in my research recently. Pierre Trudeau, when he went to China in the early 1970s, again, he op he established diplomatic relations, you know, before the United States did. The first thing he said is he said, I will never let political differences come between our relationship. I will, uh, you know, China's going to be, China's different. China, the chances of China switching to America's democratic system are the exact same chances that America will switch to China's. It's not going to happen, guys. There's no way that, you know, that America will ever embrace a socialist, you know, uh, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And there's no way that, you know, America, that China is going to embrace a full-fledged democracy exactly like the United States. So we have to really just put the political things aside. I think if we just got rid of politics as far as, you know, we just got rid of that element alone and we just focused on trade and business, I think that we would have a great relationship with China. And I think that's where I'm trying to pivot us to. And again, I'm just trying to do my job. I mean, my job is just as an American citizen who is very concerned about the pathway that we're going down. You know, we live in a different world. Again, it's not the 1970s. We have nuclear weapons here. We have, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, tension rising in the South China Sea with the issues of Taiwan, America having its patrol boats over there. There, you know, the last thing we want is anybody to ha become trigger happy and spark something because we don't need war. That's the, the bottom line. So anyways, um, Thank you guys for your support here indeed. I, I love seeing the support on the channel. I love seeing seeing uh, people people have said talk with Kishmore from Singapore. Absolutely. That's in the that's in the process I'm, as well. I've reached out to him. I, I definitely want to, you know, bring in some of these more quality, quality good. Oh, I see Jerry in here. Jerry, if you're still on the stream, just see Social Limit has made a solid comeback. Jerry, thanks for joining in the stream, buddy. Good to see you here. Um, let me just go back to my comment section here. Alex from Reporterify, I appreciate you spending time with me as well. Um, yeah, I mean, whoever steps into presidency wouldn't amount to the same thing anyway with all the corporations that control Congress. Th this is an interesting thing, and this is why I always say the United States presidency is such a difficult job because you know, you you really can't change things very fast. It just takes a tremendous amount of time. The best example of that, for example, is just Obamacare. Healthcare. You know, we've been working on this for 12 decades. We still don't have it sorted out. And again, it's just going to be continue to change and change. And that's where I think where where you America is the best country in the world to live if you have money. That's that's the bottom line. You you need to have money if you're going to live inside the United States. Because for example, you you don't want to get sick in the United States unless you have very good health insurance. And health insurance is going to cost you a lot of money. My parents before they reached retirement age and were eligible to go on to the United States Medicare system, which you go on at age 65, you know, they were paying a thousand US dollars a month for healthcare, for healthcare, a thousand US dollars a month. And that's that, and they, you just need to do that because you cannot afford to have an issue. You know, I have a friend of mine that's in California. Um, she's in her fifties. She had to have a, she has a knee issue. She has decent insurance. They've, you know, they're middle class Americans, you know. And anyways, they had a, a knee operation. The bill came back eighty five thousand dollars, and 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 whatever insurance policy she had, they were only going to cover twelve thousand dollars. So she's left paying almost seventy two, seventy three thousand dollars. She needs to pay out of pocket, and she said, "Look, I'm retired. You know, my husband's a little bit older than me. He's retired. We, you know, how are we going to pay for this?" And she shared that on Facebook. And you, and immediately everyone's like, oh, don't worry, you can just go ahead and refute that because there's an interesting culture that happens with with, and I'm probably going to do a video about this talking about the medical system in America. You know, there there's a whole bidding war. You know, you know, in China when you go to China and you know how you can haggle with prices in China. That's actually how the medical system works in America. 
it's almost like, for example, the doctors are going to charge you, let's just charge her $85,000 for this knee operation. Because you know inevitably she's going to refute that. She's going to go back to her insurance company. The insurance company is going to call the hospital and say, 85 grand, come on, that's ridiculous. Give me 50 grand. No, no, we'll do 75. All right, let's call it at 60. Okay, you know what? I got it down to 60. So you know we'll pay, well, we'll pay 15. So how about instead of paying 75, you now pay 45. Okay, you've just saved $30,000. You know, but that's that's how it works. It very much is this this system where now because you have insurance companies involved, you, you know, you have to you have to charge your prices through the roof. And so if you are wealthy and you have fantastic medical co coverage, you're fine because you don't care because your insurance is gonna pay for it. And you can pay a thousand, two thousand, whatever it's gonna cost you for the best health insurance in America. And if you are sick, America is a great place to be sick if you have that health insurance because we do have the best hospitals and the best doctors. So that's that's kind of like where the double the catch twenty two the double edged sword, you know, America is a great place to be, but you need to have money if you're going to live there. Guys, let's end the stream there. We're coming on ninety minutes. That was ninety minutes this morning. I want to thank you all for spending time with me here. We got some exciting uh, you know stuff coming out on the channel. Again, here's the, this week this video that's coming out next. Can Americans understand China? I'm excited to drop this later tonight. I wish you all a wonderful weekend wherever you are in the world, and thank you very much to uh, spending time with me here on YouTube. Take care.